Rahim, Alhamdulillah, Usat wa Salam, Rasulullah wa Ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, this is the new Muslim corner, and the intention is to provide an area, uh, a time, a place where people who have recently embraced Islam, or even if there's somebody interested in Islam, that would like to come, and Muslims who are reviving their Islam. So somebody could be born in a Muslim family but didn't really understand it and you know has the same zeal as somebody who's embraced Islam this is the place and we've been looking at the fundamentals the basis of Islam itself as opposed to starting from the top the political theory the you know social theory the Islamic banking Islamic economics we're looking at the basis of the faith itself because that really is the most important uh, aspect of Islam. And in this light, um, we started by looking at the text of uh, a great uh, North African scholar, Sidi Abdurrahman um, al akhdari And in this uh, text, he started off talking about what is required of a new Muslim. And <clears throat> again, I want to, um, you know, to, to emphasize, you know, the importance of what he said because this is a great scholar of Islamic jurisprudence, but looking, breaking it down in such a way uh, that it's really relevant to us uh, today in the world that we're living in, and especially for those who embrace Islam, uh, and then after the crowds are gone, they, they find themselves alone. So correct and authenticate your faith. This is how we began. And again, by saying correct your faith, authenticate your faith, that means everybody has a faith. So it's not like you don't have beliefs. You do have beliefs. And the problem that happened historically, you know, for the Muslim world is that when Islam was uh, spreading and entered into different lands, people embraced it by the thousands, and they came with their own beliefs. They came with their own systems, their own understanding. And unless they were able to really sit with scholars to really get lessons that, that went right to the core of their beliefs. They, they came into Islam and they did the outside uh, aspects of Islam, but then on the inside, they remained the same. And I can remember um, living in the African townships in, in South Africa, in Cape Town place called Kailicha. And alhamdulillah, we had many uh, people embracing Islam and making tremendous changes. And there was one sister uh, who was very active in the community. She was practicing Islam, you know, dressed Islamically, you know, knew the different, you know, fundamentals. And then unfortunately, her husband passed away. And my wife and I went to her house um, to give her our condolences Islamically, Tazia, and um, we, we found her, she was dressed in green, and, and that was not the way she normally dressed. She was totally dressed in green, and there were certain sounds and vibes, so we said, like, what is this? Like, are you doing something different? She said, no, this is death now. So in our tradition, this is what we're supposed to do. We dress in a certain way, and then we, they, we carry out sacrifices. And, because um, in that particular area, they believed in ancestor worship. So they believe that um, <clears throat> the ancestors are very important. When they die, they make transition. And so you don't pray to the Creator directly. Your connection is more with your ancestors. So you go to your ancestors who are already over the other side, and then they can relay your message to the Creator. It's like a mediator, right? And so we were shocked. And we said, okay, Islam has certain understandings. I said, what is your real understanding of Islam? She was honest. She said that, you know, many people here, we look at Islam as a social club. You come on Fridays, you wear certain clothes, you know, you, you say certain things. 
but our real core beliefs are the same. So when it comes to birth, death, life, we maintain our beliefs. And so really what was required in that environment, as it was in different parts of the world, is that somebody who understood, who came from the people, taught the religion of Islam through their concepts. In other words, challenged their core beliefs. And this is what the scholar is saying. Correct your faith. So you don't put it aside and then go to it whenever you feel like it. No, you correct it and authenticate it. So this is a very important thing to do um, right in the beginning. And we went through uh, many of the aspects of the piece that was written by Sidi uh, Abdurrahman al-Akhdari. He said, seek knowledge of personal obligations, like your purification, your prayer, your fasting. You know, this is the next uh, stage. He said, to stay within the limits commanded by Allah. Right? Now, the fourth point he said was, make a sincere repentance. And this is toba. Immediately make toba. And this is something not only for somebody embracing Islam, but if somebody was a Muslim and they practiced cultural Islam for, say, 20 years, they just did what their father did and what their mother did, and then suddenly the lights went on and now they really wanted to practice Islam. Some people even say, take your shahada over again. So, so they're now revived. But one of the things they need to do is to make repentance for the, that which went before. And that is to recognize you know, the sins, to turn to Allah in repentance, to have regret. Right? We also recognize that, that includes firmly intending not to return to the sin. And then compensation. You may have done something to somebody. So you need to compensate. This is a part that many people forget uh, for the injustices that they did. And then to avoid unlawful deeds, understand yourself and the deeds of the eyes and the hands and the tongue. Understand all of these aspects. That's the complete process of Tawbah. Okay? Then um, he, he went on and he said, guard the tongue against obscene speech, like cursing, the oath of divorce, rebuking, humiliating, insulting, or intimidating others without legal rights. He said to keep your gaze away from haram, prohibited things. So this is something to start doing right away. If there's something that you understand is prohibited, keep your gaze away from it. Okay? Guard all parts of the body against reprehensible actions. Love and despise for Allah's sake. Call to righteousness and forbid evil. And then he said it's forbidden, and, and, and he's given some details. You want to know what I can do to start changing my personality. And that's the way it is when you do any type of new um, activity or you change your lifestyle. So you come into a, an office and they say, okay, the rules of this office is this is how you act with the boss. This is how you act with each other. These are the limits of your speech. So you go through a process in order to get yourself familiar with how to function in this office. So he gave some of these things. Uh, he said it's forbidden to lie, backbite, spread scandal, behave arrogantly, to be conceited, to show off, especially in religion or worship, to be envious or filled with hatred. Try to take hatred uh, out of your heart. Then he said, do not remind people of past kindness, nor defame them, nor ridicule them, nor spread innuendos. He said, do not stare at the opposite sex or sensually delight in their words. Now this is getting deeper now. For those who have gone through the base basics, he's getting deeper. Do not take the wealth of others by force. Do not earn wealth through acts of intercession or borrowing. Do not delay salat after the prescribed times. So this is a homework assignment uh, that he has given that can take you through the first stages. And obviously the most important one is the first, to correct and authenticate your faith. 
So we looked at different aspects uh, of the correction and authentication of the faith, and we recognized that the most important aspect of the faith, the most important aspect of being Muslim, is not the clothes you wear, it's not um, the slogans you, know, you have or the food that you eat, right? It is Tawheed, and that is the belief in one God, monotheism, uni, unity. Wahada yuwahidu in Arabic, the Masta is Tawheed, to unify things. In other words, our concept of God. And to do that, we recognized just to say God is one is not enough. Because there's a lot of people who say God is one, but their concept of God may be the sun God. Because there's only one sun. So when they say, this, you know, we believe in the sun. Okay, so that's one. So that's, you know, their concept. So we looked at one way of uh, breaking down Tawheed. Right, getting into it. And again, these are parts that, you, you know, in your understanding of Islam, you may return to in this way or in another way in order to make sure that, that your Tawheed is right. And so we said there's three parts. One is that Allah is one, right, unity in his rule as Rabb, as Lord. There is no rival with Allah. Nobody can rival Allah. So that's Rububiya, the Rabb. Okay? Two, that Allah is one in his names and descriptions. None like him. So that's the unity, the Tawheed of Asma wa Sifat. Asma is the names, and Sifat are the descriptions of Allah. Okay? And three, Allah is one in his divinity and worship. There's no partner with him. That's Tawheed al-Uluhiya. So only one divine being and only one being worthy of worship. Okay? So these are the three parts. Now we looked at it and Rububiya was clear. Asma was a fact we found out that the, 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 the names and descriptions of Allah, it actually can take us into philosophy. So this is a lot of details in this but basically, we recognize the fact that um, we believe that Allah is unique in his names. When we say Allah is Al-Hakim, that is the most wise, okay, the most merciful. Okay, so the names and descriptions, Allah describes himself, actually gives us descriptions in the Quran and in the words of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So we accept these descriptions. We don't try to change them. We don't subtract. We don't add. But we recognize that Allah said in chapter 42, verse 11, لَيْسَ كَمِتْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ السَّمِيُّ الْبَصِيرُ There is nothing similar to him. And he is the all-hearing, all-seeing. As-samir. All-hearing. Uh, you know, Al-basir all seeing okay so we cannot say how Allah sees and we cannot say how Allah hears okay so this is where we were at in terms of previous discussions correcting and authenticate the faith and again this is a new Muslim corner not a lecture although it might sound like that sometimes but it's not a lecture okay so uh, if you have any questions, you could put it up on the chat. Or, um, in our class, if anybody has questions, uh, the only thing we're saying is that we don't want political questions. We don't want to know what is happening in the Muslim world and why is there no Khalifa and then, you know, what the elections in Tur Turkey are or something like No. We're dealing with correcting and authenticating faith we're dealing with the basis, you know, of our faith. So I want to open up the floor if there's any questions that anybody has up until now, uh, something from last week, which was a, a holdover, or any questions concerning anything so far. Okay. 
you, you can check in, check in, in the chat. We're okay. The next part is dealing with, again, we're going to the basis again, and this is food for thought. It's something to keep in mind because, you know, sometimes Muslims say things in Arabic and, and they don't realize what they say. And Arabic is a very flexible language and it's a very deep uh, language. And, and sometimes grammatically, there's certain terms, when you, even when you're learning Arabic, there's certain terms that you might see and you try to translate it um, directly, literally into English and it doesn't fully make sense. Like, for instance, you'll hear Muslims say, Allahu Akbar. And Allahu Akbar, we say Allah is the greatest, but in Arabic you have Kabir, which means great, Akbar, which means greater, and uh, Al Kabir, or Al Akbar, the greatest. But Arabic, um, many times, it gives you an abbreviation, like you understand the meaning. So if you look at that, that, that phrase, Allahu Akbar, it actually means Allahu Akbar min kulli shay. Allah is greater than anything else. Okay, but you don't have to say that. This is how this phrase came. Okay, so when we look at the kalima, and that is the beginning of the road for a Muslim. When the person says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, or Ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasulu, or Rasulullah, that's the beginning of the road. And we hope that it's the end of the road, that the last thing you say in this life should be these words. Okay, so these very important words now. It's, it's the beginning and it's the bottom line. So, what does it actually mean in Arabic? And the more you understand Arabic is the more you, um, you can understand, understand the strength of the statements. Because the greatest thing that Arabs had at the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, over 1400 years ago, the greatest um, part of their culture was language. They did not have beautiful palaces. They did not have beautiful rugs beautiful cuisine, porcelain, like many other societies had, but their language was so flowery and so expressive. Sometimes you have one word and, and you can say it like sleep. You can actually, they have like 16 words or so for sleep. Now we might say in English, and this is colloquial English, you say uh, he dozed off, he's dozing, right? Or we would say in America, he's not, he nodded out. Okay, doze, what is doze? What is nodding? Right, so these are different levels of sleep. So there's a form of sleep where you're not totally in like REM sleep. You're just in the edge now, in and out. So there's a way to express this in Arabic. There's all these different ways. So when we say la ilaha, Illallah. La means no. So la is what you could say, it's a negation. It's a negation. So when you say la ilaha, when you make that statement, then you are making a negation. So you say there's no God. That's a powerful statement. There's no God. La ilaha. And that in itself is a powerful statement. I remember um, it was in Germany some years ago. The Muslims opened up an Islamic center and they wanted to get the information. They want people to come to them. And this is before heavy social media like we have today. Right? So they wanted to, to, to get it out to the public. So, um, but the Germans at that time, there was a lot of atheism. There's a lot of atheism today. So the, they believe there's no God. So now they said, okay, we're going to do something. So they went on television. It was like evening news. There's no social media. People are not looking at their cell phones. 
Everybody's looking at television, right? So they went on the television, they bought some space, and in this advertising time, they said, there's no God. That's it. And the Germans clapped their hands. They're like, what is, who's bold like this to put this on thing? These Muslims, you know, like this, what is this? The next night, la, there's no God. And then the third night, and now they had a big audience waiting to see what would happen the next night, and they said, la ilaha illallah. For more information, there's no God except Allah. For more information, contact the Islamic Center at such and such road. You see what they did? So that's what we're doing in a sense with this. We are cleaning the table. The slate is clean. There is no God. So you can't say there's a little one, there's a big one, there's a family one, there's a cultural one. There's no God. Then you say, illa. And then, illa now makes the transition linguistically, so it's clear, and then you say Allah. So when Allah comes into that, you see, it is clean. The whole slate is clean. So it's a negation and then confirmation. This is like ling linguistically. It's a negation and a confirmation, and so that means Allah alone should be worshipped, creator, nothing else. Okay? But you also have, um, there's also the opposite could come. We're saying la ilaha illallah or something different. What is the second part of the kalima? So the second part is wa well, Muhammad and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. So when you say that, you're starting with confirmation. Okay, so the second part doesn't start with negation. It starts with a confirmation. Because you've confirmed with Allah, then you confirm with risala, prophethood. You see? And by making a confirmation, in this case, you are implicitly saying Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, nobody else is. Nobody else is. You see, so linguistically, um, this statement and the early revelation of the Quran to the Arabs was so powerful linguistically that people would actually embrace Islam just like listening to statements. That's something very difficult in these times. But they respected their language so much. They were so much in, in, it was so deep. Their language was so deep. And their understanding of the language, even the common person, the person could be a desert Bedouin, but they had a mind like, you know, British would say like Shakespeare. But the person's a desert Bedouin. And when you look at the Quran itself, and it starts off in the, the, the second chapter, Surah Al-Baqarah, where it's saying, Alif, Lam, Mim, Thalik al-Kitab, La Raybafi. That's how the Quran begins. It says, Alif, Lam, Mim, these letters. And the Arabs did not use Alif, Lam, and Mim like this before. It's like somebody coming out and saying, A, B, C. So everybody's going to turn around and like, OK, what's wrong with him? Alif, Lam, Mim. Then it says, this is the book in which there is no doubt. And it goes on. But the word thalika is used for distant. In other words, if I say, uh, this is a pen, and I looked across there and I said, that is a chair. So in Arabic, you would say hadha and thalika. So when you say thalika, it's distance. It gives you a feeling of distance. So when you say, this is the book in which there is no doubt, and you say, Thalika, it gives you the image of a book far away that's actually coming towards you. So this is, a, 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 this is a, what they call mu'jiza i'jaz logawi. 
It is, it is a miracle linguistically. It's miraculous. Uh, and you, you wouldn't understand that unless you can actually speak Arabic. And I mean proper Arabic, not even street Arabic that you might find in some Arab countries. But this is what is called fusha. If you understood this, this is the language. So this is our kalima. Um, this is the analysis, the negation, confirmation, and then confirmation, uh, which negates. Okay, so this is the kalima, uh, which is a powerful statement uh, that we pray, inshallah, will be on our lips throughout, throughout our life. So I want to open up the floor for any questions. Um, was that clear for everybody? Um, you know, any uh, observation or question that anybody has, you know, concerning the analysis of the kalima? Okay. Uh, one is, can someone say the shahada completely alone for the count? Is there a requirement for someone to witness it? Yes. Um, can a person say the shahada completely alone, um, and would it count? What's the requirement? Yes. I mean, basically, the shahada or bearing witness—that's what shahada is. You know, to the oneness of Allah and, and the prophethood. It's between the person and Allah. But the witness is there to make sure that they've done it correctly. Because you may say something that you heard on television or you heard somebody across the street saying, and you're not saying the right thing. You see how sensitive these words are. So the witness is the person who witnesses what you said. right? And they make sure that you're saying it correctly. But it's not required. Technically speaking, that person who, who, who said the kalima who believed in the Creator, was Muslim. It is our belief that that person who's living in the Amazon basin in Brazil, who is alone in the jungle, doesn't know Jesus, uh, Muhammad, Moses, anybody, and they say, oh, oh, oh Allah, oh God, Great Spirit, I believe only in you, I worship you, and that person dies, that person is Muslim. Did not have, they, and they don't speak Arabic. This is a different concept than what Christian missionaries had when they went out. Okay, next question. Yeah. How, how Arabic is required to learn for new Muslims as it is a necessity to learn how to pray and read Quran? Yes, yeah, so Arabic, you know, is, is Arabic a necessity, necessity for new Muslims? Technically speaking, um, it's not, because Allah knows all languages. However, the last revelation came through Arabic. And so by, by saying it in this form, it's part of, you, you're, you're latching on to revelation. You're not latching on to Arab culture. Because there were people who spoke Arabic who were the enemies of Islam. But you're latching on to the revelation. And so you, you, you try the best that you possibly can and, and, and you learn the phrases, even though you're making mistakes, because it takes time, and then you learn the basic phrases with the meanings, okay, and you gradually come into it. It's not required for a person to know it all right away. Even if you just started your prayers, and you just start and you say, Allahu Akbar, and the person starts praying, and they don't know, they can't read the opening chapter, so you're allowed to say things like Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah, La ilaha illallah. Just any statements that you know in, in Arabic, any basic things, uh, you can say it and go to the next um, part of the prayer. So it's not a requirement, but it is uh, necessary to complete as soon as possible. Now, Okay. Question. <coughs> Yeah, so I mean, it, it, technically speaking, it is okay it, it, you know, in the beginning. Um, however, it, it is better to really, you know, getting into the rhythm of the prayer, you know, that's what, which unites us, attach, attaches us onto the revelation. Then y y y instead of saying the opening chapter, you can just say Allahu Akbar, you know, subhanAllah, just learn those, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah. You can say those, those phrases in Arabic. So it is better to say those phrases in Arabic, um, you know, as soon as you possibly can. 
Because many of the prayers are, are silent anyway, right? So when you're silent, is what's in your head. But learn those, you know, the Arabic as soon as you can. You know, it might sound, you know, strange in the beginning when you're reading it, right? But try, the more you repeat it, is the more it will make sense. And this is good because then when you're with somebody who's reading the Quran in a group, you can appreciate what they're reading because you already tried to remember it. So, so, so you know, we, we try as soon as possible, you know, to get into that Arabic. Otherwise, you can say those phrases uh, until that point. Okay? So, Sorry, yeah, go ahead. So no, go in ahead. terms of the pronunciation, like when you say it or hear it, it sounds like illa, Allah is like combined. But do you have to pronounce illa, Allah? Like when you're, when you're saying, when I say it sounds like la ilaha illallah, like you're not pronouncing the L-A. Yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, well, again, this, this is a linguistic thing. Because the, the Aleph, uh, what's in front, I mean, the, the, that A part, Aleph part on Allah, you know, when it meets the other word, it becomes soft, like. Okay, so that's so the flow is so illallah. So you flow right into it. Okay. It's not a hard um, uh, Aleph. There's different forms of that Aleph sound, soft ones and hard ones. So in this one, this time it does flow. But if a person said, la ilaha illa Allah, that would be okay. Right? But the better Arabic would be to flow uh, right into it. La ilaha. So you can't say la laha. You've got to say ilaha. See, in this case, there's a different sound. Now, any other general questions that anybody has? Now, going on to the next part, uh, we understood the kalima, right? Remember, tawheed is the basis of our faith. Anything that we can be described as, the most important quality of a Muslim is their belief in one God. That is the most important thing. Although culturally, it's not necessarily the most important thing. You know, many times the people will say, Muslims will say, when you accept Islam, change your name. So they say immediately, you've got to change your name. Maybe they don't like to hear the name John or Jane or whatever. They don't like to hear that. They say, change your name. And some of them get upset when you don't change your name. It's like you're not really a Muslim. Okay? And it is good to have a name in Arabic, which has the nice, but it's not required. And what is the proof of that? And that is the companions of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. For the most part, 99% of the companions, when they embraced Islam, because all of the Prophet's companions were new Muslims because there was no Islam there before. Right? None of them changed their name except for a few. Abu Bakr was Abu Bakr. Omar was Omar. Khalid, Zainab. They kept their names. So it's not a requirement. You see? Now there was a person whose name was Abdul Shams, the slave of the sun. That was his name. And when the Prophet, peace be upon him, heard that name, he said, okay, I think it's better for you to change your name. Change it from Abdul Shems to Abdul Rahman, the slave of the most compassionate. Because Abdul Shems means you're a slave of the sun. You're a worshiper of the sun. And you know, that's, that would not be good. Every time somebody calls you, they say, a ah, sun worshiper, a ah, sun worshiper. No. So, and in, in most cases, 99% of the people accepting Islam uh, wouldn't have to change if they don't want to. Um, however, it is recommended to do that. And what we, the middle road for those who are embracing Islam, and it doesn't have to be right away, and that is that you change your given names, but your family name remains the same. So the person's uh, given name, the name may be uh, James Earl Jones. Right, so James and Earl are given names. The Jones is the family. So you keep the Jones and you'd say, you know, Khalid, uh, Muhammad Khalid Jones. 
Abdurrahman Jones, but you kept the family name because we're not supposed to be changing our families. And now this, we have a particular, myself uh, and many Afro-Americans, uh, Afro-Caribbean, those who suffered with the Atlantic slave trade. Um, the slavery was so bad that they actually took away the names of our families. So you'll find people named um, James, LeBron James is a famous basketball player, or Williams. There was no James or Williams in Africa. That's a European name, right? And what would happen is the slave master would then, if his name was Williams, then everybody on the plantation was Williams. So this is how these names start coming in, okay? In South Africa, and this is something I was shocked when I went to South Africa, because you had Muslims who were slaves, who came from Indonesia, and you had Africans who were slaves who were from Africa. And what the apartheid people were doing is that they weren't changing people's names, but what they would do is that they would change um, the sound of the name. So if the person's name was uh, 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 Muhammad Ibrahim, when they wrote it into the register, they would say, uh, Mohammed Abrams, because they know, they know Abrams or Abraham. They don't know Ibrahim, and they change your name. And, and because you're forced by the system to accept this name, or they'll throw you in jail, so now you go to South Africa and you'll find Muslims, you know, his name is uh, Abdurrahman Abrams <coughs> or Ishmael. Like the names, you know, like it doesn't sound right, but they were forced to do that. In our case, they wiped it away totally. So <clears throat> in the 60s, we went through a revolution. And part of the revolution was to throw off everything to do with slavery. So we called our family names slave names. And to be a true revolutionary, get rid of everything. Like Muhammad Ali, his name was Cassius Clay. Cassius is like Roman, Roman senator or something like that. Cassius. And Clay is a European name. So he said, no, my, my, my name is Muhammad Ali. Now some people say Muhammad Ali Clay, they still want to get it. But he was Muhammad Ali. So he changed it completely. And, and this, is, this is what we did. So, But now what we realized is even though that name was not originally the family's name, generations have gone by with that name. So therefore, there could be somebody named Jones who's actually your cousin. And if you change your name completely, you might meet somebody and you might want to marry your cousin or you, might, you don't even know your family. So, so the balanced position turned out to be, change your name, like there's, there's one famous uh, Muslim in California, his name was, um, uh, he, he changed his name to, to Hamza Yusuf Hansen. Hansen was their fa his family name. He was known as Hamza Yusuf before, but then uh, the balanced way, Hansen. You see, so there's, you know, names can be tricky. You know, there's, there's a lot in different names. So, um, 98%, I think I heard you say, of um, the companions didn't change their names. Yeah. Um, so those names today are considered Muslim names, right? So you, you quoted examples of Abbas or Osman. Right. So back then, they weren't considered Muslim names, but now it's very common for us to have those names, and they're considered Muslim names. Yeah. So what is a Muslim name? Yes, yeah, so, so, so this is a very good question. You know, what is a Muslim name? Because in those days, you know, this was not a, a non-Muslim name which became a Muslim name. Okay? So technically speaking, it wasn't the name that made the person the Muslim in the early times. Because Abu Jahl is Amr. You know, he has a, you know, a name. There is the Umar. There were, there were people who were enemies of Islam, total enemies of Islam, okay? And 
their name uh, was, was an Arabic name, which somebody might use today and say that's a Muslim name. No, technically speaking, it's, it's an Arabic name. It's not technically speaking just by the fact that it's Arabic makes it Muslim. No. Because Arabs in those times and up until today can be non-Muslims and enemies of Islam. And it's shocking because if you took, if we could get a picture of people in those times and you saw uh, Abu Jahl and you saw um, terrible enemies of Islam, Hind, and you say, Um Jamil, these people coming along, he would have a nice beard and he'd have long clothes and you'd look and say, MashaAllah, looks like a real serious Muslim brother. Right, because beard's long. That's just the culture of the people. He had long clothes. That's the culture of the people. Right? Or the woman is covering up, maybe covering her face. That's the culture of the people. It's not necessarily what made them Islamic. What made them Islamic is the kalima, tawheed. That's what distinguished the Muslims. Now, time has gone. Islam has been established. You know, lines have been drawn between East and West, between Muslims and non-Muslims, and, and cultural things come in. So you say, like, that's a Muslim name, that's not a Muslim name, you know, whatever, in a sense. I mean, especially if it's a name like um, Abdul Wahid. If you think a name like Abdul, Abdul Hakim, you know, when it's names like that, then you know that's a Muslim. That is like a Muslim name, because you're saying slave of, of Allah, Abdullah, right? But not just Arabic, because I remember seeing the name, there's some Arabic names came, and somebody said, okay, this person, his name is Abdul Masih, was in, so is this person Muslim or Christian? Or somebody said, no, it's Abdul Masih, like that's Arabic, that's a, no. Abdul Masih, Al Masih is the Messiah. So his name is the slave worshiper of the Messiah. He's an Arabic Christian. That's how you can tell Arabic Christians. You can tell them by their names. But it's an Arabic. They, they do not use our names like we do in Arabic. They have their own sets of names that give them more of a Christian understanding or it even shows their, their belief. So it, it, it's, it's technically speaking not correct to say to a new Muslim, take a Muslim name now. No. But you could say that um, you know, it's recommended for you to take a name with the beautiful descriptions of Allah or somebody who reminds you of the prophets or, or the great you know, uh, women of Islam, wives of the prophet, you know, take one of those names because when people say your name, a beautiful meaning comes with your name. But some of the names are used in Arabic. If you can go to South America now and you find a lot of women named Fatima. Fatima's Spanish name. Even Omar. Omar is, a, is in Spanish, people use it. It came through a lot of ways, but now Christians, you know, might use it there. Okay, so there's a lot in the name, and the more knowledge we have uh, is the higher you know, our, our level of understanding is. The point I'm trying to make for the new Muslims, you don't have to change your name immediately. You don't have to. However, I would recommend that as, as soon as you can, you can even take a nickname in a sense, a name that you like and you want to eventually change, right? Take that name so when you meet other Muslims, they don't go through a change when they hear your name, right? It's out of ignorance that they're doing that, right? But you don't actually have to do it, okay? So language is very important. It's very important. Any other questions online? Again, this is New Muslim Corner and uh, Tahmid. Any, any questions online? This is New Muslim Corner and uh, it's a chance, it's, it's a round table discussion you know, for us in dealing with these issues. Yeah, there is one question. Okay. Dear Sheikh Quick, 
Uh, this question may not be relevant, but currently a polemic in Malaysia. Kalima Allah is being used by Christians in church. The Malay community, especially politicians, are totally against it. Can you enlighten us, Oma and Nusantara? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, this, this, is, a, this is a deep question, uh, but it's relevant to our discussion. And that is that there's, there's a big controversy going on in Malaysia that the Christians are using the word Allah to mean God in their churches. And so the Muslims are upset by that. And there's a discussion. Technically speaking, the Muslims should be joyous that they're using the word Allah to mean God. Because that means they're closer to Islam. Because as I pointed out uh, in the beginning, I believe, if you look at the Christian Bible in Arabic, and there are versions of the Bible um, that you can get in hotels in the Arab world, like you got Bibles, the Gideon you know, Bible in many of the hotels, they do it. Go to Jordan and some hotels and there's an Arabic Bible. It's Arabic. And, and when they say in the beginning, like the first page about Genesis, and Allah, God created, the, you know, in the beginning, uh, you know, it talks about God created the heavens and the earth. The word they use is Allah. And no Arabic-speaking Muslim has any problem with that. They actually say that's good for us. Because you're saying the word Allah. You're recognizing the Creator. Okay, so technically speaking, um, the wisest position, you know, would be uh, to allow that as long as they don't take that name in vain. In other words, maybe within their culture, they're using that for the wrong purposes. Because I don't know Malay culture enough. But, you know, I don't, I don't see the logic in that argument. I would say that the, that the wisest position would be, you know, to use it as a, a form of da'wah, of calling to Islam. Even discuss it with them. What does Allah mean? Why are you using the word Allah? Explain to them what it means. It's in your Bible. So you can start doing da'wah to somebody. If you explain, you know, what it actually means. Okay? Yeah, that was the only question. So now, as, as we move on now, and we go to the next phase, because Tawheed is one thing. That's the basis. But the opposite is shirk. It's shirk. And <clears throat> it's the opposite of Tawheed. And shirk from Ashraka Yushriku is to associate partners with Allah. That is shirk. I don't know how it came into the English language. In American English, I think it's Canadian as well, we used to say, uh, he shirked his duty. You ever heard that before? Mm -hmm. No, maybe that's an Americanism. No, no. Heard You've heard it. Yeah, he shirked his duty, mm -hmm. which means like he didn't perform the duty properly, right? And I don't know where in English that could come from. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you went back a couple of centuries, you know, it, it came out of this. But a shirk billah, and that is to associate partners with Allah. Okay? And that is polytheism. We're using the Latin monotheism is one polytheism, many gods. Okay, so that's the opposite. And um, it is considered to be the gravest sin. Shirk, by the text of the Quran itself, is saying that Allah forgives all sins. He will forgive all sins except for shirk. Okay? But then in another uh, verse, it is saying, in the Jamian, Allah forgives all sins. So one is saying everything can be forgiven except shirk. The other verse says, Allah forgives all sins. So the scholars came with Jama to understand both, and they said, what it actually means is in this life. Allah forgives all sins. So there's nothing you can do in this world that cannot be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But after death, shirk is the only thing 
that is not forgiven. Everything else can be forgiven. Okay, so this is the major overwhelming understanding of the scholars um, as to what it actually means. Okay, and um, as we said here, Allah is revealed, He will forgive. So these are your verses in the Quran, verse 4, uh, chapter 448. Is, is one, and the second one is chapter 39, verse 53. So these were the two. Okay, so shirk is serious. It is the only unforgivable sin after death. It is the most, it is the worst thing you can possibly do. And that's hard for some people, you know, to come to grips with. This person is a mass murderer. Right? Or this person has you know, dropped a bomb on a city, whatever. They've done terrible crimes. Shirk is actually worse. And really, I mean, it's not a good thing, you know, to make a comparison like this, but one of the things that would hurt a mother and a father, especially the mother the most, the child can, you know, do wrong and everything, but if, if your child denies you, if your child denies your motherhood, like that, that will hurt you maybe more than anything else. They might have done a lot of things wrong, but if they deny your motherhood and then leave you, that, that, that's a terrible thing. Imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us and given us everything in this universe, and then you're going to deny the Creator when the signs are right there in front of us. That there's power. Everybody knows there are powers greater than us. Everybody knows this. So how can you deny it? So shirk is a really serious thing. So therefore, the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the scholars and enlightened Muslims over the ages put extra time in perfecting their tawheed to make sure that they were worshiping the one God. And we had the three categories. There may be other ways of doing this, but this is three good categories. Okay, so they had, they had a way, a system, to make sure they were, they were not breaking their tawheed. You know, and some people will say, well, you know, you, you have to be sensitive. You've got to be sensitive to this. And um, I'll give you an example of natural sensitivity. There was a friend of mine from California, Chicago, and we were over in Arabia. And when he accepted Islam, he took the name Ali Akbar. Now, if you're from India and Pakistan, you might have heard this name before, Ali Akbar. Actually, it's wrong, because it's saying Ali is the greatest, right? And that would be the extreme Shiites, who, who in, in, in some extreme form, worship Ali the cousin of the Prophet. So they took the name Ali Akbar, which actually in Arabic is wrong. So this brother, he's looking for some names, and he said, oh yeah, that sounds nice, so I'm going to name myself Ali Akbar. We, we were changing our names. There was nobody to guide us. So he, so he went to Riyadh, and there's some Bedouins who live in the middle of Riyadh and Nejd, and they're really strong in their Tawheed, right? That's one of the main teachings that they have. And so um, we were in the masjid, and my friend came in, and I introduced him to this Bedouin. And I said, this is my friend, Hadha Sadiqi Ali Akbar from uh, America. This is my friend, Ali Akbar from America. And when the Bedouin heard, he said, La, Allahu Akbar. I said, OK, brother. This is my friend, Ali Akbar from America. And he said, La, Allahu Akbar. He said, Allah is the greatest. And we were getting upset, right? Especially the brother from Chicago, right? Chicago guys are tough, right? But, but then we said, wait a minute. I see what he's doing. So I said, why did you say that? He said, because no, you cannot say Ali is Akbar. Allah is the greatest. Tell your friend to change his name to Ali Abdul Ghani or something like this. And so when he heard this, we said, MashaAllah. This brother has given us, you know, what's equivalent of a lecture 
you know, of a preacher, you know, in a mosque, just by his response, his tohedic response to your name, and his sensitivity to shirk. You see it? So the brother changed his name to Ali Abdul Ghani. So shirk is a very serious thing. And it's something that we should be uh, well aware of. Now, to look at shirk, again, polytheism, look at the setup. So you have the major form of shirk. And that is that you have the creator. And I'm saying God with a capital G. And then you have a partner. right? And then you go to the human being. So when the human being is praying to God, they don't go through, they don't go straight to God. They go to the partner. And, and this is why the, 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 uh, the worship of the ancestors, putting the ancestors in between yourself and the great spirit, because the African people believe in God. They do believe there's a God, just like the Arabs believed that there was Allah. But they wanted to go through idols, Lat and Uzza and Suwa and different idols to get to Allah. You see? So in this case, no partners. There should not be a partner, an intermediary, because then that would be polytheism. Okay? And um, there is another form of shirk. And this gets very deep, but it's important to understand right away. Uh, and that is what is called a shirk al-asghar. So you have the major form of shirk, and you have the minor form of shirk. Okay? And um, what is the minor form of shirk? And that is, it is called a riya. And that is performing acts of worship to be seen by people. Arriya. And this came from the Prophet Sallam, you know, told his companions, I fear the most on you in one hadith in translation. What I fear the most on you <coughs> is the minor form of shirk. Everybody's afraid of shirk now, right? But the Prophet said, I fear the minor form of shirk on you. And they said, what is that? And he said, Yaqum ar rajal that the person will get up and he will make his prayer beautiful to be seen by other people. He just used that as an example. Good example. What is the concept? The concept is the person is praying and um, they're making the prayer. You should be making it for Allah. But many times the person makes the prayer because, or they change it around because the people watching them. Like the difference between you praying at home or praying at Juma in the mosque where there's other people watching you. It's a natural tendency. Everybody has a form of riyah. We all do things because we're being seen by people. When you, every day when you look in the mirror and you say, what am I going to do today? I'm going to go to the office. I'm going to play sports. Right? You will dress according to where you're going to go. And sometimes because you're going to be seen by people, you go to the job, you have to look a certain way. That's okay. That's not worship. It's, it's, it's what's required in the job. But when it's your worship, which is changed because of people's eyes. Riya comes from the word ra'a, which means to see. So riya is performing these acts of worship to be seen by people. And I may have used the example earlier, but I'll say it again for those <clears throat> who were not there. I saw a living case of this in, when I was in a masjid in Cape Town, this is in South Africa, and it was after Juma, and this brother got up to make two rakats of prayer, two units of prayer, and a group of people came next to him on the sideline. And as he was making his prayer, somebody said, MashaAllah, like, look how beautiful this brother makes his prayer. Now put yourself in that position, right? You're hearing people uh, compliment your prayer. 
So you're, you're praying to Allah, right? But suddenly the compliments are coming. Right? And you say, oh, and something inside you, your, 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 your self, your lower self, will say, make it more beautiful. Because they're complimenting you, right? That's a, a human weakness. And so he makes his prayer, and he's crying, and he's staying down a long time on the ground. And the people are really overwhelmed by his prayer. And then he gets up, and he finishes the prayer, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and he turns to the crowd and he says, and I'm fasting too. You understand what he just did? He's really showing off, right? He said, I'm fasting too, right? Because he really wants to capture the crowd. You see? That's Riyadh. That's Riyadh. You know what some people might do? There's a thing called wara. And, and, and that is a high level of what we call taqwa. You have taqwa, which is the consciousness of Allah, fear and hope, but you have another stage called wara. And wara is you will give up something permissible for fear of falling into something prohibited. That's a high level of taqwa. In other words, in this case, this person is, is making the units of prayer. If they felt that they were going to fall into riyah, they could say so they could break the prayer and walk away. Because you don't have to make that prayer. And, and you can stop your prayer for whatever the reason is. One example of what I, one of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his name was Abu Bakr as Siddiq. He was a high level of wara. And on one occasion, he'd eaten some food, and then somebody said, is this food um, haram? Is it prohibited food? I think this food is not good. And the other, you know, many companions said, well, you know, it's already gone down, right? Like, it's not your fault, because you already ate it. Abu Bakr, I'm being graphic, he made himself vomit. And he brought it up. He didn't have to do that, right? But his level of taqwa, and that's an kind of an extreme example, but his level of taqwa is he's going to give up something permissible because he doesn't want to fall into something prohibited. See, that's a high level of consciousness of God. Okay, and that, that will get you out of riyah. And something like this is really important, and I know this... Many times, people who do public speaking or you know, anybody who does anything, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, you're constantly in a struggle against Ria. Because, you know, somebody who gives money to the masjids, okay? Do you give that money? You see, some people will give the money and they say anonymous. They don't want their name mentioned. Because they have a fundraising day and they say, MashaAllah, Brother Ali, you know, gave a thousand dollars for the masjid. Takbir. And everybody says, you know, for Ali, right? Another person said anonymous. Because they don't want, they're not giving it to get the takbir from the crowd. Now, the scholars will, you know, it is allowed if Ali gave that money to encourage people to give. So sometimes you'll give the money because you want to encourage other people to give. That's okay. But some people will give and they want their name on a plaque in front of the mosque. So anybody comes in knows they were the ones that bought the mosque. Or they put it, that, that can be riyah. Right? If you did it for Allah, it doesn't matter whether your name's written on the building or not. Because you did it for Allah. See? This is the minor form of shirk. And it's a really serious thing. It, it, it's so serious that the Prophet said, Riyah will creep into my ummah, my nation, like a black ant creeping into a dark room on the darkest night. Good description. Undetectable. It's undetectable. It's, how can you see a, 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 an ant at, in, in a dark room? No. So people will start doing things because they want to show off to other people. I'm a Muslim, right? So they're do not doing it for Allah alone. And, and Riyadh can cause a lot of problems, you know. A lot of problems. Question. So we're on the same thought. Um, <clears throat> performing the act of piety 
but for the intention of likes or followers or whatever. Yeah. This is, Riyā is acts of worship. It's not just doing things, you know, for other people. It's an act of worship. Now, I don't know whether people consider Facebook an act, act of worship. Don't worry, my clothes. Yeah. <laughs> some, some, I, I think there's some of them. That's what I meant. Like, this is on Facebook, right? And this is an act of worship for you, teaching that. Right. So. Right, so I mean, if I was doing this class only because I want to show off to everybody yeah. on Friday nights, that would be Riyā. I'm not doing this class because I want to have a new Muslim corner and, and help other people know to show up. But Facebook and Instagram and these likes, right? This is another culture in itself. And it's not necessarily, uh, I, I wouldn't want to say it's an act of worship. Although some people are even committing suicide because they're not getting likes. Right? And it's wrong. I'm not saying, you know, to, to want more likes is something wrong with the person. Unless, of course, if they have a business based on their likes. Like sometimes if you monetize, if you're getting money you know, from your site, that's how you live. Then you have to get a certain amount of you know, likes and entries and you know, subscriptions in order to get you know, the money. That's your business. So you'll strive to do that. Question. Right. Right. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, "Your deeds are based on your intentions, and everybody will get what they intend." So that person who was doing that, uh, you know, online, if their intention is to get fame. You know, and to get glory, whatever, then that, that would be Riyadh. Because it's their Islam now, right? It's the fact that they're in submission to Allah. But if their intention is otherwise, they want to spread Islam, they want to counteract Satanism, which is so powerful on the internet, that's good. That's a form of struggle for us now. We actually have people who are fighting jihad online. They're fighting against evil online. They're counteracting the evil online. That's okay. It's intentions, right? It's intentions. And it's dangerous too because sometimes you might start off one way and the fame gets to you and you go down. And you'll see that, like I say, especially with entertainers and speakers, that that's probably the clear, you know, you'll see people will change when the crowd is big. You know, and fame starts coming to the people. Shaitan's going to constantly want to get them to just want the likes in terms of popularity, whereas their initial intention is probably because they want to spread the message and they want to help people. Yeah, so you have to constantly watch it. That's why Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was simple all of his life. Even at the end of his life, he had only a few changes of clothes, very simple. Gold was coming into Medina. He would give it all away and then go to sleep. So he maintained sim simplicity. Right? Because, you know, he did not want to, not say that he would, but as an example, you know, you know, that we have to maintain simplicity because Riyā can strike everybody. So this is not just, the, the example of the scholars and the teachers is, is one of the, you know, clear examples, but it can, it can happen to even to come everybody. Riyā can strike you. So, so you do have to, you know, watch your intentions. Of course, if you're praying by yourself, that doesn't matter. Because no, because ra'a is to see, right? So somebody's got to see you, or it could be suma, which is to hear, like they heard about you, right? So I mean, ra'a can come, you know, like that. Question online.
Yeah. Okay, so the question is, you know, that um, uh, to what extent can a new Muslim uh, be involved in previous religious practices? Like they accepted Islam and his Christmas gathering or there's a mass, you know, whatever. As far as family is concerned, the new Muslims should maintain their family. And, and, but what we watch out for is shirk. It's polytheism. So that if these, in these gatherings, if there is polytheism there, and we're going to go into the details, inshallah, in the, in the coming sessions of what shirk actually can be. If there's polytheism in it, then we avoid that. Now, I can talk about you know, cases exactly because coming from a Christian family and being around people, <clears throat> the example of a brother and sister, you know, the, 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 you know, the grandmother died, all the family is coming out to the church, and so they attended it, they attended it. They made their presence. But during the, the religious ceremony, they were on the side, or they, they left when the prayers come. But they, att they attended, and they extended their condolences to the family. They paid their respect, but they did not involve in the worship. They did not involve in the worship. And we even had a case, I remember years ago in the Jami Mosque, when I was the imam there, and this brother um, passed away, a young brother. He was upcoming football player in North York, North York like he a <clears throat> really good player. And some unfortunate thing happened to him and he died. And so the, his whole high school wanted to come out. And this was one of those collegiates. And so that meant that the mosque was going to be crowded with people. And 90% of the people would be non-Muslims. What are you going to do? Some hardline people would say, don't let them in. No. You know, and then the, the preacher wanted to say something. The principal wanted to say something. So we said, no, this is a form of dawah. Let them in the mosque. But I went to the preacher and the principal, and I said, we respect your religion, but when you make your prayers, you know, please make the prayer to the Father. Because we don't believe in intercessors like Jesus, right? Like they may say, in Jesus' name. But they could say, oh God, our Father, you're still in Tawheed, right? And it's still Christian. So, so, and he was glad to, to, he had no problem with that. And, and, and he was glad that, you know, we would come together. And we had a beautiful gathering. Everybody shared their emotions. And that was a form of dawah for many of those people there. They had never been in a mosque. They would never have any reason to come to a mosque. But they came. And we shared you see? So the, the key point is you, you make your, your, your presence felt, but don't be involved in the shirk or the ceremonies. Question. So in terms of like you go to a gathering, for example, I've been to a gathering of Christians, um, and it's not like a religious gathering. It's just a getting together. But then they say grace over the food. Right. And then I'm, I don't know what to do because, you know, saying someone else's name over the food makes it haram, right, for you? So I've, like, I've been in situations like that where I never thought about it, and I ate the food, and now when I'm in those situations, I don't know what to do. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, the, the, the case is, you know, uh, our sisters, you know, at a, you know, in an occasion where uh, non-Muslims, you're all together, and, and they say grace over the food. What is the position? Okay? Our basic position and what makes the food halal is how it was sac uh, sacrificed. The food is halal. So the food is halal. Yeah. Okay? So they made their prayer. Yeah. So number one, you don't um, involve yourself in the prayer. Yeah. Right? So you wouldn't be saying amen to that. Mm -hmm. Right? So you don't involve. And then before you eat, you say bismillah. This is stressing See? me out, No, no, no. This is the exact thing. Because Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he was, he, it, it is, he, he was described, he went to a Jewish man's house. And the Jewish man, people of the book, gave him food. And he said, Bismillah, and he ate. Because we're allowed to eat the, the, the food of the people of the book. So he said, Bismillah. So by you saying, Bismillah, you negated their grace. And the food is halal. That's the key thing. If the food was not halal, if it was a nice ham, 
you know, a nice piece of pork, then you can say bismillah all you want. You can't make the pig halal. That's what makes it difficult because, like, these are like Christian friends who specifically sure, buy sure. halal food for me. That's right. So if I go there and then say, oh, I can't eat it because you just said grace over it. No, no, in this case, it's okay. okay. It's just, you just don't say amen to their grace. And then before you eat, you say bismillah. If, if you want to even say it out loud, right? Before you, so they can hear you saying bismillah. So you know you're, you know, but it, it's, 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 in that case, it would be okay. Question? Yeah. Uh, as a new Muslim involved in an interest-based loan prior to reverting, but now it is very hard to get out of that loan. Mm. What can you do to show Allah you regret this, but can I get out of it right away? Yeah, so this is a, a person accepts Islam and they're in an interest-based loan. Coming into Islam is in stages. And a person is not required uh, to drop everything to completely change their life immediately. And in this society here, you know, many of us, you know, 90% of the people or more, you know, who have wealth are caught up in mortgages and all kinds of different things. That's the society we live in. So therefore, it's recommended that that person, you know, show, you know, regret, and they try to come out of that as soon as possible. But, but, but for that person to like destroy their life, it, it, it's not required for them to immediately change. But they, need to, but they need to make intention and movement to come out of it as soon as possible. And how you do it, you gotta go to a financial expert, you know, about that. Um, don't ask me, because I'm a poor man. You know, so I, I can't tell you, uh, you know, what to do with your thousands. Okay, question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what is your opinion on young Muslim trend and Muslim majority nations wearing, wearing kinds of amulets, small statues, cultural amulets, and those people justify it as cultural attire? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In terms of shirk, the forms of shirk, we will be going into the forms uh, as we go into uh, the major form of shirk. But, you know, since you're here and we're there, you know, you, know, you, you may not be in the next class. Um, <clears throat> it's all based on intentions. If the person wears jewelry just for beautification, then there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but what the danger is, if it's a Muslim, it's like some Muslims will wear like a pendant or something that says Allah on it. Okay? So the only problem is you can't wear this in the toilet. So you have to take it off every time you go in the bathroom. You can't take the name of Allah into the toilet. I'm talking about in Arabic too, especially. You can't. Uh, but if the person is wearing the amulet as a means of protection against evil, as though it is a type of power force that is protecting them, then that is a form of shirk, whether you call it cultural or not. And therefore, it is wrong. And we will be going into the details of that, how that developed, what it actually means. But just for your sake now, no. But the intention is there. It could be a cultural bracelet that they wear or something like that. Nothing wrong, just beautification. It's your culture. But if they think that this is some kind of God protecting them or some kind of power force, then it can fall into shirk. No. Yeah. Question here on... on Is it okay to acknowledge pluralism, the, the coexistence of many different beliefs, and the acknowledgement that those other beliefs, people may have other ways of knowing the world and, yeah. and understanding it and accepting it as true or okay, but still having our own, the pluralism? And yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it is, Islam does recognize other ways, other forms of belief, and, and, and especially the people of the book, you know, in Medina, there were, you know, Jews and there were other, you know, Christians were, like, you know, they're allowed in a Muslim, you know, state. And even some forms of Hinduism were allowed when Muslims ruled India. You know, so therefore, um, you know, it is, um, we, we recognize that there are other ways of life. We definitely recognize it. Do we believe that everybody's correct? No. 
And, and this is the struggle you go into. I face this uh, <clears throat> in going into what is called interfaith. So you have interfaith gatherings, right? And you can have an interfaith gathering where you are showing respect to other people. You're trying to understand their concepts. You do it with the intention of dawah, right? You do it with the intention. But the problem is, when the interfaith reaches the point where I was in one gathering and they said, okay, now we want everybody in this group to unite. And there was Buddhist, Hindu, uh, uh, native traditional religion, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, everybody's there. So we want to unite. What can we unite on? So somebody said, well, maybe there's a great spirit, there's a God. Can we do that? And then the Buddhist said, that's nice, but I don't believe in God. You know, so I said to myself, how can I be united? Yeah. I can respect him. I can help him. I can live as a citizen with him. But I'm not united in a sense. Prophet Ibrahim, uh, uh, peace be upon him, he broke the idols. He broke his father's idol. You know, so we don't believe it is correct. But we show respect in dealing with the other people. Right, okay, so this is the same thing that I just said. This is a plural, we're in a pluralistic world, you know, today. Uh, but as long as we stay in this area of religion, right, this pluralism thing can get crazy, right? But, um, you know, that's the challenge that we're in. We're in the society where we don't agree with everything that everybody does, but we can live in peace. There's nothing wrong Islamically with that. Any other general questions uh, anybody has? So, so this really is uh, the beginning of, of our discussion. I want to open the floor for any general questions now that somebody may have. As long as they're not too not political and you're not too deep, I I'll leave the floor open for any general questions that anybody may have. Yes? Um, so somebody told me once that if the food is not halal, then you can pray over it. Yeah, if the food is not halal. Yeah, well, you, you know, getting into food, especially non-pork food, um, there are different positions that scholars take in terms of, especially being in Canada or, you know, the West, when they're dealing with the food. Because if you consider this to be the people in this country as people of the book, because the Quran does allow us to eat the food of the people of the book. So if you consider it to be the food of the people of the book, you know, then you can um, you know, uh, uh, say Bismillah, and then you can eat it. However, um, what happened was there's one great scholar in Arabia, and you know, they wrote to the sheikh and they said, okay, we're living in America, like, what are we going to do with this food, McDonald's and, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken, like, what can we do? So the sheikh, and, 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 and they told him, well, it's Christian country, you know, whatever. So he didn't know. And he was a blind man, too. And he said, it's okay. If it's a Christian country, then just say Bismillah, and you can eat. So they took this as um, permission to start eating everywhere. And I think, that I think and, and this is my opinion, and many scholars' opinion, that's a mistake. It's a mistake, because we even found out that in, in some of these um, uh, outlets, McDonald's or whatnot, we even wrote to McDonald's and they said, we don't use pork at all, but in our oil, we have some, there's some lard in it. Because by having lard in the oil, it, it stays longer. Like vegetable oil evaporates. So the lard holds the oil longer. So they put a percentage in to hold the oil. They don't necessarily tell you that. But we ask them specifically. And some people who work in slaughterhouses, 
and, and these, you know, McDonald's and these places, and they see what that food is and what these people are doing, they're not going to necessarily eat it. So, so the, the strongest position, well, I'll give you an example. I, I was living in Jamaica uh, for a couple years. And we lived on a street in Kingston, Jamaica. And this is back when early days, 80s, no halal shops, nothing in Jamaica. Okay, so, but down the street was a Christian uh, preacher, and he had chickens in his backyard. And he used to sacrifice his, the chickens by slitting, cutting the throat and letting the blood run. So, so the balanced scholars say, as long as they're not like strangling the animal and drowning it, you know, whatever, if they cut the throat, you know, then it's Christian, you can eat it. It doesn't matter even if the person is a Christian with Trinity or anything like that, as long as they are people of the book. Because the people of the book in the time of the prophet, peace be upon him, also had Trinity. Trinity was already there. Remember the Council of Nicaea, right? Yeah, the, it's 325 A.D., that's what a lot of people don't realize. Trinity was already there. You see? So when you said people of the book in his time, it meant also those people. Because there's something of the book still in them. There's something there. So, so it was allowed. So therefore, that was the case when we, when, you know, when we knew uh, you know, that that was there. It, it was you know, acceptable. Once we were able to sacrifice our own meat, then we didn't have to do that. But, you know, just seeing anything and saying, Bismillah, eating, Bismillah, eating, you have to watch out what you're eating. And, and being sure about what you eat, I believe, helps your Islamic personality because it makes you more aware of things. You're not so loose-minded. And sometimes Muslims are eating and drinking everything and they just get loose with their culture. We cannot be loose in this society because there are so many pitfalls, dangers within the society that we need to be vigilant uh, all the time. Any other general questions uh, anybody has? Uh, yeah. For those of us who are learning to practice the tenets of Islam, we will encounter those who are too harsh or too soft in their practice. What's the best way to discern true Islamic belief? Uh -huh. Okay, the true Islamic belief, you know, number one, to understand Tawheed, you know, the oneness, understand shirk, polytheism, you know, then you understand the true Islamic belief. In terms of practice, how people apply Islam, that will vary according to the person. And, you know, that's why it's important. And we will be, if we continue the class on, which I intend to, con to continue this class, even when the regular classes stop. So inshallah, in June, July, we're going to continue. Um, but, you know, seerah, the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the more you study his life, is the more you understand what true Islam is. So one of the best ways to understand true Islam is to know the example of the Prophet. But human beings are like this. There are some who are too strict. They don't have wisdom. You know, the more knowledge you have and the more you understand that the Prophet, peace be upon him, was a balanced person. Okay? But true Islam really comes down to Tawheed and Shirk, right? That that's the basis of being a Muslim. Yeah. Yes, you know, th this can get deep in terms of the nuances amongst Muslims. And I don't want to confuse the new Muslims at this point in time. However, um, the reality is that Islam is broad based and there's cultures that affect it. You know, there are e even what we call Islamic movements. People have to practice Islam in a certain way. This can impact how they practice Islam. But the more we understand what is prohibited and what is permissible. That's why I, you know, I recommend the book Halal and Haram in Islam of Yusuf al-Qardawi because he's a balanced scholar. You need to get balanced scholars. 
We're not taking you to one extreme, you know, or another. Uh, uh, but there's going to be nuances. We grow into that. And that will come, inshallah, you know, because Islam is over 2 billion people now. So human beings, you know, have different experiences. And so therefore you'll find different uh, versions of Islamic practice. But the more we understand what Islam is, then you, then you know what Islam is not. That's what you have to. You have to know the difference. Any other general questions? <clears throat> it, it was up there in the shelf there, halal and haram and Islam. Yeah, I, I put it on the, on the shelf there, <clears throat> somewhere on that shelf. Yeah, I mean that that is that's another Pandora's box. Okay. That that's a big question, <laughs> right. you know. That is there. And like I said, Yusuf Qazawi is it is in there. Okay. He does touch on recreation, right? Sure. Basically, <clears throat> what I will say, which some people might consider to be controversial, whatever, I don't care. You know, there is music. The statement "music is haram," it's prohibited. By that statement alone is wrong. That statement is wrong. Because music means what some, one, one person said, organized sound, whatever that means, right? Organized sound is music. So is organized sound prohibited? No. Imam al-Ghazali, one of the great scholars, he said, is the bird prohibited? Listen to the song of the bird. Man. No. So in other words, you will see in the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, when he came to Medina, the Ansars, the people of Medina, they brought out their singers, the Ansar singers, and they sang a song, Tala al-Bedru alayna, famous song. They sang it. There's music, right? Okay, so music, organized sound itself, is not prohibited. The problem comes is what kind of organized, what is in the, the sound itself, okay? Obviously, if there is nakedness, there is shirk, you know, things like this, un-Islamic things, that would make it wrong, okay? There's, there's a big discussion about the instruments or no instruments. Again, that there's no straight, uh, you know, opinion on this, by the way. That, that, that's, a, uh, you know, so I'm not even going in that area. The point is that music is permissible with limits. Okay. Now, any other different, uh, any uh, final questions that we have? Okay. So we're going to close the class to give people, uh, you know, a chance to, you know, prepare for Maghrib. I have something else that I have to go to actually, and uh, inshallah, we'll, we'll be continuing the classes on. Um, you know, we also have another class on Tuesday nights, if any of you are online, which, which is an interesting class as well. We're dealing with Muslims, you know, coming to the Americas before Columbus and some historical things might be interesting. It's at 7 o'clock online or here <coughs> on Tuesday nights. And inshallah we will continue. And it's the intention at this point to try to continue the class uh, into the summer. Generally in IIT, everything shuts down. So our main classes will close down, but because of we're dealing with new Muslims, which will continue, you know, I will try to continue this as much as possible, unless something does come up. If something comes up, then we have to skip a week, you know, you know, for that. But we'll continue the classes straight through, uh, you know, inshallah, as long as we possibly can. So uh, we'll close with that. I have a safe journey, journey home, and and may Allah subhanahu wa taala, you know, accept us and forgive us for the stakes, mistakes we have made. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdika. Nashhadu an la ilaha ila anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Wa akhira da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.